So, hello everybody. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to our first faculty research presentation of the semester and the first in our beautiful new event space. I'm so grateful uh, to Dr. Papali for being our. Did I pronounce that properly? Um, I'm Dawn Emsalem, I'm Director of Library Services, and today I'm happy to welcome Dr. Gabriela Papale, who will be sharing her research in tonight's presentation, Forget Me, Forget Me Not, New Frontiers in Alzheimer's Disease. Dr. Papale was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and raised in southern New Jersey. She received a BS in chemistry from Drexel University in Philadelphia, and a PhD in Pharmacology and Toxicology from Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Dr. Papali joined the Salve faculty in August 2020 where her main teaching responsibilities are biochemistry and general chemistry. And her current research is focused on STAR-D6, a protein which has been linked to risk for Alzheimer's disease through genetic analysis. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gabriella Papali. very much. I am very thrilled to be here. Um, so please, if at any time uh, you cannot hear me or need me to speak louder, I'm usually pretty good about that, but if you need it, let me know. Um, so I will preface my talk um, with the fact that I am an accidental neuroscientist. I did not plan to be on this path. Um, my PhD and my um, postdoctoral training were all in cardiovascular disease and when I was at my previous appointment before I came to Carthage I had a neuroscience major who came to me and said I'm a senior and I'm going to graduate and I haven't done any research and I would like to do some research can we do some research and I said okay there's a class of proteins that I've always been really interested in and I've never done anything with them so let's do some literature searching and see if we can find anything cool and so he found a paper that links star 6 to Alzheimer's disease, and that's kind of everything kind of snowballed from there. So it's just a really cool finding. So um, I had to learn all of this stuff. So hopefully that translates well to all of you. Um, but I like to start um, my talks, and I, even in class I throw some quotes here and there, but this is from Aesop's Fable, The Fox and the Mask. A fox entered the house of an actor and, rummaging through all his properties, came upon a mask, an admirable imitation of a human head. He placed his paw on it and said, what a beautiful head, yet it is of no value as it entirely lacks brains. So your brain is super important, right? Your brain makes you who you are. Um, so basically, like you're a brain walking around in a body, right? Because everything that you're thinking is up here. Um, so your brain is super magical, so there's lots of cool things that your brain does. So first of all, your brain is in continuous development until you're about 25. Um, and so brain development happens back to front. So it starts, you know, in the back of your brain and moves forward to your frontal lobes, which are up here. And so your frontal lobes are where all your planning and reasoning happens. And so that's why maybe prior to age 25, you don't always <laughs> make the best decisions, right? Or, um, you know, not as much planning, right? But again, last to mature up here. So uh, also, electrical impulses can travel up to 268 miles per hour. And so that doesn't seem super fast when you think about the short distance that we're actually going, right? If we're talking about going from neurons in your brain to the end of your fingertips, that's not a very long distance to have to go, right? So we're talking about microseconds to get information from your brain to your fingertips, right? If you touch a hot, surface, you don't want that to take a long time for your brain to register that you shouldn't be touching on surface, right? Um, also, the neurons, which are the cells that make up most of your brain tissue, um, you can fit a hundred thousand of those in a piece the size of a grain of sand. So you have billions of neurons in your brain. So when you think about how much information that means that your brain can hold, it's a lot. Um, so you have virtually unlimited memory storage. So if I were to relate that to like computer memory, 
you can store about two and a half petabytes of information, which is approximately a million gigabytes of storage. And so if you want to think about how much storage that actually is, it's the, basically if you were to record a television playing continuously, 24 hours a day, you were to record all of the television shows that played in that time period, you could do that for 300 years. And that is, that is, 100, that is a million gigabytes, right? So we basically, you, in your lifetime, you could never use all of the memory storage that you have, right? So the thing that we are still kind of learning about is how memory actually works, right? So we can store a lot up there, but how do we do that? Um, and so there are actually three stages to making and recalling a memory. So there's encoding, storage, and retrieval. So got a little diagram of the brain over here. Um, so we've got your prefrontal cortex, which is really important, as well as your, hypo, uh, your hippocampus, which is this like lumpy part that's under here. So you actually have two hippocampi because you've got two hemispheres of your brain. So everything we have here, you have in both sides of your brain. Um, and it's called a hippocampus because it looks like a sea horse. And the Greek words hippocampus mean horse sea monster. Um, and so that's why we named it that. It kind of looks like a little upside down seahorse. So. so encoding. The very first thing is that you have to be paying attention. If you are not paying attention, nothing's going to stick up here. So if you're distracted and you know, you're on your phone or looking through your emails and you're trying to learn something, it's not going to happen. It's not going to stick. You're there's no point in you, you know, even being there, right? If you if you're not paying attention, because it's just not going to stay here. So, one, paying attention. Then you're going to perceive something with your senses. So if that's like touching a hot surface, hearing a sound, whatever that happens to be, something that you're perceiving by your senses, your hippocampus gets that information, and then along with your frontal cortex, kind of makes the decision whether we need to remember this or not. Right? So if you're touching a hot thing, your brain probably wants to remember that. Um, and so in that process, info gets saved in your sensory memory. So now we get to the storage part. So once it's in your sensory memory, your brain needs to decide if it's short term or long term. Right? Is this something I only need to remember for a short period of time or is this something that I want to be able to recall over and over again? Um, and so the way that you make it long term memory is through repetition. So again, if you are reading something really important and need to remember the information, reading through it once probably isn't going to stick, right? You have to read it several times to make that information stay. Um, so again, the more you practice or remember something, the stronger the connection gets between the neurons that are responsible for that information, and the easier it is for you to remember it. So the next thing that happens is retrieval, right? So I've learned the memory and encoded it. I've stored it, and now I have to be able to retrieve it and get it when I need it, right? So that's recall. So usually you do that unconsciously. It's not like you're thinking about file cabinets in your brain and searching for the right file and pulling it out, right? Like your brain does that without really having to think about it. Um, and usually it's going to depend on how effectively you remember it, whether you can retrieve it properly or not. So, Generally, we forget information or have retrieval failure when we've got distractions or if we don't remember the information clearly, we didn't retain the information properly, or we have trouble retrieving the memory itself somewhere in that process. So with each new experience, you are going to rewire your brain just a little bit every time. So you can do that throughout your whole entire life. There's never a situation or a period of time where your brain stops being able to do that. Um, so it's really important to have new experiences, learn new things. Um, and I will tell you that the more educated you are and the more you are reading and learning new things, the lower your risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. So um, super important to stay mentally active. So I am going to talk about um, a man called Henry Molson, really quickly. And so the study of this man kind of revolutionized the understanding we have about how human memory is organized. So Henry had 
chronic seizures throughout the first almost three decades of his life. Um, and then, um, most likely from a bike accident he had when he was younger and got a head injury from. But basically, doctors decided that they were going to do a surgery about when he was age 27, which was in 1953, and they resected portions of his brain with the hope that that would kind of cure his seizure issues, right? If you take out these portions, hopefully we can stop the brain from misfiring and we can stop the seizures. Um, what portion they removed um, included the majority of his hippocampi, so on both sides, um, and then whatever was left ended up being dysfunctional due to atrophy or basically the tissue died. Um, so basically, the surgery left his working and procedural memory intact. So uh, procedural is like when you do tasks without thinking about them, right? Like um, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, things that you really don't have to think about. Your body's just like kind of going through the motions. So all of that was intact, but his, um, he was basically unable to add new events to his explicit memory, which is your conscious and internal remembering of facts and experiences. So he could remember lots of things pre-1953, but after 1953, he could not make new memories. He couldn't remember places, people. It was very difficult for him. What's really interesting is that they realized he actually could still learn new motor skills, so even if he didn't remember learning the motor skills. So there's one set of experiments they did where they basically had him sit in front of the mirror and he had to draw an image on a piece of paper, but he could only look at the mirror image to draw it, right? So you can imagine that for anybody that would be kind of difficult the first time that you do it. And so obviously the first time he tried to draw this, he made several mistakes. Um, and so then he came and did another trial another day. Didn't remember doing the first trial at all, but he made less mistakes the second time and even less mistakes the third time. So his um, you know, motor skill was improving, right? He was learning how to do the drawing, right? Learning new motor skills, even though he couldn't remember doing any of that process. So it tells us a lot of interesting information about how your brain processes and stores information. Um, one other thing uh, was near the end of his life, he could fill in entire crossword puzzles. And so anything that required pre-1953 information, he could fill with no problem. If it required knowledge post-1953, he could actually alter previous memories so that he could remember that information. So one example is remembering, let's say, that Jonas Salk was the answer to a clue, right? So Jonas Salk is the man who introduced the polio vaccine. It was not made public until 1955, which was two years after he had his surgery. But polio was around before he had his surgery, and so he could basically attached Jonas Salk to his previous memories of polio, even though that happened after um, his surgery. So the brain is astonishing and works in such weird ways that we're still investigating and figuring out. But um, we owe a lot of what we know to, to this guy. And there's some controversy about his case and whether appropriate consent was given. Um, so I really urge you to read up on that because informed consent is very important and we've taken advantage of a lot of populations as a medical community over the years so I think it's important to kind of learn from things like this so definitely recommend looking him up again his name is Henry Mollison. So as we age our hippocampi basically slow down their ability to make new neurons. Um, so we're not quite as good at learning and storing memories, even though we can still do it, right? But um, dementia is where we have parts of the brain, including the hippocampus, deteriorating. And so this is this results in defects in memory, language, problem solving, all the things that they were kind of testing Henry on, right? So um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. There are other forms, so I'm sure you heard about Bruce Willis recently, um, so he has a frontal lobe dementia, I think, so his is a little bit different. It's not Alzheimer's, it's a different type of dementia, but not all dementia is Alzheimer's, it's just the most common one. Um, so I have a little video, and I'm going to try to, hopefully you can hear it, if not, I'll put my mic up to the speaker, and we'll see, but um, this video, uh, think like a scientist, inside Alzheimer's disease, this is featuring Greg Ryan. Um, 
he describes himself as an investigative reporter living with early onset Alzheimer's and not dying with it. Um, and he's still active. He's been writing articles as late as you know, a few months ago. So he's still very active in this. I'm um, very much a proponent of being honest about the process and really bringing it to the forefront and letting people know about it because I think we kind of forget about what people might be going through when they're going through the earlier stages of the disease. So. Yeah. 
there after it's going to be hot yeah. it's worse than that it's very stressful to lose a thought in a second two days ago the light went off and up with my son I didn't know who he was where I was what day it was and I was in a panic he calmed me my son calmed me down because they know it's okay to him
So what happens is, in an Alzheimer's brain, if you were to look at that side by side of a healthy brain, you actually see that the Alzheimer's brain actually has some shrinkage, especially in the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus. And then the enlarged uh, ventricles are also pretty hallmark, and that's where you have cerebrospinal fluid, and so that's kind of expanded. So those amyloid proteins are kind of on the outside of cells. They get chopped up, they stick together, they form those plaques. And then the inside of the cells have a different protein called tau that gets unfolded and messy and tangles up with a bunch of other tau proteins. And so that ends up killing the neuron eventually. And so those two things together are what thought to contribute most to development of those processes. So the thing is, this preclinical Alzheimer's disease, so when you have no symptoms at all, but you do start to have brain changes, this can be up to 20 years before you display any symptoms. And so it's really hard to figure out if you're one of the people that's going to have that issue. Um, and so um, as it progresses, again, symptoms are going to start to interfere, interfere more and more with everyday activities until you get to severe dementia where they're interfering with most everyday activities. So, the idea is to try to figure out how we can find people in a pre-clinical Alzheimer's stage because that's probably the best place to start intervention, right? Um, and we're going to talk about some of those. So there are some risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so the best way, the best preventative measures that you can take, um, not smoking, no excessive drinking. There's also been links to not getting enough sleep to risk for Alzheimer's disease, so you need to sleep, <laughs> and restful sleep, not just a little bit of sleep, restful sleep. Um, uh, exercise, eating right, so it's all things that keep us healthy in general, right? But um, definitely things that are shown to kind of reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease. So other risk factors, the main one is age. So the older you are, the higher your risk is for developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, as a medical community, we've gotten really, really good at keeping people alive for a really long time, right? We've got people that live long to their 90s and it's not, you know, that uncommon anymore. But the issue is, the older you get, the higher the risk for Alzheimer's disease. And so we're, we keep seeing this uptick in cases. It's actually the only disease in the top 10 where the cases are increasing. Um, you know, deaths from cancer, cardiovascular disease, those are all decreasing. And so this is the only one that's still increasing over the past 20 years they've been monitoring it. Um, so family history is a risk factor. So obviously if someone in your immediate family has Alzheimer's disease, um, you have a higher risk of getting it. Um, and there are genetic factors. The main one is the ApoE gene. So you get a copy of this gene from each of your parents. So you have two copies of this gene. And there's kind of three flavors of this gene or three types of this gene. We call them alleles. And so there's E2, E3, and E4. So E4 is the one that's been linked to risk for Alzheimer's disease. So if you follow any celebrities, uh, Chris Hemsworth actually found out that he has ApoE4, so Thor from the Marvel Universe. Um, so, uh, so he came forward and talked about a lot of that, but um, the thing is, this doesn't definitively say that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, it just says you have a higher risk. There's plenty of people that have the ApoE4 allele and do not develop Alzheimer's disease at all. Um, so obviously you have a higher risk if you get two copies of that particular flavor, so one from each parent, but um, really the, that's the one that's mainly linked genetically. There are some other more uncommon genetic risk factors. Um, so there are mutations in the amyloid precursor protein and some proteins called presamilin 1 and 2 that contribute, very rare. Um, and then also trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So um, trisomy means you have three copies of genes, so normally you just get one from each parent, but people with Down syndrome have an extra chromosome 21. So they have three copies of that chromosome instead of two. And interestingly, that chromosome is where the gene for amyloid precursor protein is. So they just have an extra copy of this protein. They have more of this protein present in the brain, which means that they end up having more plaques. And so it's much more common for folks with Down syndrome to get early onset Alzheimer's just because they make more of these plaques. Um, so there are some drugs that have been approved by the FDA to treat Alzheimer's, but um, 
basically there's two types. So there's drugs that treat the symptoms, and there's drugs that treat the disease progression. So those are the exciting ones we want to just approve this. Um, so uh, drugs that treat symptoms. So one of them is cholinesterase inhibitors. So I showed you the synapse in the previous slide. So those neurotransmitters, they need to get broken down. We can't just leave them in the synapse because that makes your neuron keep firing, which if you let that go, that's how you can get like a seizure, right? So we want to make sure that we're stopping the signal as well. And so what those enzymes do is they kind of break up those neurotransmitters so that we can restart the signal and refire the neuron, right? We want to be able to start it and stop it. So if we're letting those, those neurotransmitters stick around for longer, hopefully that can improve the connection between the neurons. Um, so they're also glutamate regulators. Glutamate's another type of molecule that acts as a neurotransmitter. And so that's, again, getting some signals in the brain to pass the, the, the signal down more neurons. Um, there's a combination of both of them. Uh, but there are also symptoms with Alzheimer's that aren't cognitive, so insomnia and agitation are a couple. So insomnia contributed with uh, Valsamra, which basically um, uh, inhibits a chemical called orexin, which is involved in your sleep weight cycle. And then um, atypical antipsychotics, um, uh, the, the only one that's approved is Rixalti. Um, and so that is used to treat association uh, agitation associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that drug is normally used to treat schizophrenia, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, but it's gotten off label or atypical for use with Alzheimer's disease. But these are the only drugs that have been FDA approved, and all they do is treat the symptoms. Um, there are new class of drugs that are coming out that are anti-amyloid and intravenous so basically what that means is that um, you probably heard about antibody infusions with COVID, right? So folks could go and get an antibody infusion and that generally helps them fight off COVID if they have like a severe case of it. So this is a similar idea. So you would go and get an infusion of this antibody. This antibody recognizes the amyloid plaques in your brain and helps to clear them. Um, so there was one that was on the accelerated approval. Um, so that was Agenhelm. So uh, Adipanumab is the you know, uh, chemical name for that. Um, so the issue is um, the FDA has an external board that they have for new drugs before they make their final decision whether something is going to get approved or not. This external board voted to not approve this drug and the FDA approved it anyway. And so there is a big investigation into why this happened because very uncommon. Um, there was a, a lot of weird interactions between the FDA and the company that was producing this drug that was not great. Um, so as far as I know, this is not fully approved. Um, however, there's another drug that is very similar. It's a similar type of drug, does the same type of thing called the That is approved and it went through a large 18-month study. So they had almost 1,800 people, half of them got a placebo, half of them got the um, <clears throat> Lecanthi infusion, wide age range, and basically they had to have at least mild cognitive impairment um, or mild dementia, so not moderate or severe dementia, only the earlier stages of the disease. Um, and they made sure that they took groups from different ethnic and racial backgrounds. And so what they found was that there was actually up to a 30% decrease in cognitive decline over the period of that study. Um, and so, again, it's decreasing cognitive decline by clearing the amyloid, but that doesn't mean that it's reversing things or curing the disease. Um, so if you're not sure of the difference between the traditional and accelerated pathways, so traditional pathways, they require some actual metric that says that these are clinically useful. So in order to be passed, it has to be that, you know, this drug increases survival rate of cancer patients, for example, right? They have to prove that through a series of clinical trials. And clinical trials go from really small studies to really large groups of people before they can be approved. So 
there is an accelerated pathway, which is what was used for the COVID vaccine, right? Um, that is not something new. I think a lot of people thought that that was like something they put out for COVID, but it's actually something that was introduced um, in the bill that was passed in 2012. So this is a path, accelerated pathway has been around for a while. It's just not been as publicized as it was uh, recently. So basically what happens is they can have a surrogate endpoint. So surrogate endpoint is let's use the cancer drug as, a, as an example, right? So let's say that there was a cancer drug where they saw that it was able to shrink tumors, right? That doesn't definitively say that it's increasing survival of those patients, but it likely does, right? If I can shrink someone's tumor, then it likely increases their chance of survival. And so we can kind of, because we can predict that outcome based on preliminary data, we can have this faster pathway of we're doing those confirmatory trials while it is getting reviewed and going to market. And so that's what happened with both Adjuham and Kemi. Um, Kemi though was just converted to traditional approval, I think in July, so very, very recently. Um, so the Kemi pros again, slow progression of the, it slows progression of the disease by up to 30% based on the initial trials. Cons are that it is extremely expensive. Uh, it is over $25,000 a year to get these infusions. You can go get them two to four weeks, depending on how um, advanced your Alzheimer's is. Um, I was reading that Medicaid would cover approximately 80%, but that's still a big chunk of money for most people. Um, and there's other costs associated with this, right? You have to get multiple PET scans. There's lots of hospital visits outside of this. So this is a very, very expensive situation and not everyone is economically equipped to deal with this. And so this is a big conversation that's being had around this drug. Um, it also can have serious and potentially fatal side effects. Um, the main one being ARIA, A-R-I-A, that's amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. And basically what that means is that in certain areas of your brain will swell and you can even get small brain bleeds from getting this, this antibody infusion. Most people don't have any symptoms from that, so they may not even know that, that they have that going on. Um, and it usually clears itself. However, for some people that can cause you know, headache, dizziness, nausea, you know, and it can be serious, right? So we can have like an extensive brain, which is obviously not what we prefer. Um, and again, this medication does not cure the disease or reverse any of the cognitive defects that that person has. It's just slowing the progression of the disease. So um, there is a study currently um, recruiting actively participants. It's called the AHEAD study. Um, and basically what they want to do is use lecanby in people who have amyloid plaques but do not show any signs of cognitive defect yet. And so the idea is if we can get those people earlier and clear plaques earlier, can we prevent those people from progressing to Alzheimer's disease? And so this is something you can if you would like. Um, so this is what the PET scans look like before and after treatment with Lecanby. So the, the reddish areas are the amyloid plaques. You can see afterwards that it's really cleaned out um, large amounts of the amyloid plaques. Um, so basically they're looking for folks um, between the ages of 55 and 80, I believe. Um, and so basically they're going to give you a blood test and I think based on the questions they're asking in their questionnaire online, I think they're looking for people who have that AKB mutation. So they're looking for people who have that particular flavor of the AKB gene. Um, so if you have that, then they're going to look at your brain, they're going to do a PET scan, and basically see if you have amyloid or not. If you do not have amyloid plaque, you're not eligible for the study. Doesn't mean you won't get amyloid plaque, it just means at the time they look at your brain, you don't have any, and so you're not eligible. Um, and then there's like people who have a small amount and people who have like a, a moderate amount of plaque. And so then they're kind of splitting those people into two different groups. So if you have a small amount of plaque, you're going to get infusions every four weeks throughout the study. If you have what they consider a higher level of amyloid plaques, just they're going to give you infusions every two weeks for about two years, and then they're going to switch you to every four weeks after that. Um, so the idea is, you know, hopefully giving this to you more frequently will help that clear the plaque that you have. But um, 
they are actively recruiting for this. I do not know when they're closing the agreement, but I thought that was really, really cool. Um, so the problem is we still haven't thought about a cure for this, right? Or a way to reverse kind of the damage that's been done. It's really all can we prevent it or can we at least make it so the progression is slower, right? Um, and this is where I say we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket, right? We don't want to put all our eggs in one heavy basket because there's other things that we can be looking at. And so my small little egg that I contribute to this field is uh, work that I'm doing with a protein called Star E6. So um, it stands for Star E6, like a transfer chain of K6. This is why we shorten things, right? So the protein is called Star E6. If you were to look in your body and see where it's found, it's in testes, ovary, and brain. And the most likely function for this protein is that it delivers steroid hormones like testosterone to their cellular destination, so wherever they're supposed to go to cell. Um, and I say it's most likely function because we still aren't 100% sure what this does under normal circumstances, and so it's really hard to figure out how that applies to Alzheimer's disease. We don't know what it does normally. Um, so if I give you an example, if we were to do a search on PubMed for uh, publications or amyloid beta, that's the main protein, right, for Alzheimer's disease, you get over 74,000 publications. If you do a publication search for Star 6, there are 29. So we really, we don't know a lot about this protein, which is, makes it exciting. There are some things that we do know, so it is expressed in the hippocampus, so this is a slice of the hippocampal formation from rats, and everywhere you see that dark right there, that dot, that's going to show you where that protein so it's mostly in the nuclei of cells, and so that's why it's so brown. Um, so it's showing up in the nuclei of cells of the hippocampus. Um, if you induce brain injury, um, so pylocarpine is a chemical that can induce seizures. So if you give rats pylocarpine and you track what happens with star 6 more even more of it concentrates to the nucleus. So you see more of the protein kind of concentrated in those nucleus that you have here. Um, and the amount of star 6 that's present in the hippocampus increases with age. And so if we look at different areas of the brain, so the darker this band is, the more protein is there. That's what it is. Um, so if we look at the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum, uh, we have 6 months, 24 months, and 28 months. We see that in the cortex and cerebellum, got a reduction, so it's only about 60 to 70 percent of what was there at the beginning. 28 months is old for a rat. I know that doesn't seem like a long time, but it's, it's considered elderly <laughs> for, for a rat. Um, but you see in the hippocampus, we actually have an increase in the amount of star 6 that's there. So again, that's really, really interesting. And I mentioned this, but there are four studies that came out that did genetic, uh, so G, uh, genome-wide association studies or GWAS studies. Um, so basically, they're looking at genetic information from people and trying to associate it and correlate it with a certain condition. So what they found is there's a specific mutation near the star 6 gene that if you have it, you're, you have an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. We again, don't know what this protein does, so it's really hard to kind of relate it to that if we don't know what it does. So this is where my you know, research questions kind of come in. So we've actually in the literature not confirmed that star 6 is in the human hippocampus. Um, we don't know whether the amount of it differs in normal brain and Alzheimer's brain. So that's one of the things we're working on right now. So May is actually working with me on that. We are going to be requesting tissue samples from the NIH's NeuroBioBank. And so these are folks who have donated their bodies to science. There are tissue samples available. So we are requesting human hippocampus tissue samples. Um, so obviously we need to go through our IRB here first, but we're not collecting the samples ourselves and we're not going to be identifying anyone, so it's actually not a terrible application to do to get it. We just have to go through the proper channels, which they and I are working on now. Um, one of the other questions is, why 
so this is through the NIH. It is a super, super cool initiative. So the idea is they want to get one million people to sign up for this so that they have genetic information for one million people. Um, they have over 400,000 participants so far. Um, I think this started around 
So I get some funding through Rhode Island Henry um, for my lab. Lots of folks have come to my lab. These five people were in my lab over the summer, and this is a picture we took at our end of summer conference we did. And then I have a couple of collaborators in. Does anybody have any questions? It's a question. I remember hearing way back that you couldn't diagnose Alzheimer's until the person had passed, right? That they did something. Yes. Like that. So that's still true because then I, I, I wonder about that that study that they're going to do and you can measure. So I think they're, they're I think they're better with PET scans now. The problem is you really only get um, so you really only get a PET scan if they think you might have it. <laughs> and so this isn't a routine thing that like everybody gets, right? So if they feel like you might have it, then they can give you the PET scan. I know that they do do confirmatory stuff like an autopsy to like confirm that there were actual like plaques and stuff. But um, we're getting a little better at not necessarily having to wait. Um, one interesting thing, and I did not mention this, but there are actually a lot of people who, if you look at their brain at autopsy, have plaques and they have tau tangles and they have absolutely zero Alzheimer's symptoms. So it's a very, very complicated, complicated disease. So it's, uh, and, and part of that is, I've talked about how, you know, having like a higher level of education and staying more like mentally active can prevent it. And so I'm wondering if maybe that's like masking the Alzheimer's symptoms in a way, and so maybe they do actually have symptoms, it's just not as noticeable because they, their brain can kind of work around it, but I do think that that's interesting that people, there are people who have no, like, noted Alzheimer's symptoms that still have the same brain morphology. about so one in three Americans right and how do we line up do you know with the rest of the world in terms of that are we high low um, or? so actually the majority of cases are in countries that have um, more disadvantaged socioeconomic statuses um, which I think is interesting um, so there is a high prevalence here but it's actually more prevalent about genetic testing, where that plays in all this. So they can they can test you for ApoE, but again it's one of those things that I don't think they do unless there's there's a there's a thought that maybe you have a predisposition to that. So I think like if someone in your family has it, um, I think you can kind of make the case to get screened, but I don't think it's something that's really super readily available for people. Again, unless you're in a special circumstance. Right, so it's like your family members have it, and maybe it's like really prevalent in your family. Then I think they would do screening. And again, like Chris Hemsworth came out that he has it, but he also has millions of dollars, and so I mean he can kind of get screened for anything he wants to. Um, so again, you have that kind of people who aren't of that same status don't have access to the same types of you know testing, which I think is a big problem that you know. Again, it's not it's not something that you can just like go to your physical and say, I want to get screened for ApoE4. Um, but you know, maybe someday it can be like that. Um, I have a question that well, people are thinking of formulating theirs. Um, so what does a day in your lab look like and what kind of work are you doing with your students when who are researching this? So I like Moments or some of this, right? But it's uh, there's a lot of reading, so we do a lot of literature, literature reading. It's actually I think a little easier for my lab than some others because, like I said, there's only 29 publications, so you can actually get through all of them in a semester if you wanted to. Um, but uh, basically, learning some basic techniques. So we do um, some uh, DNA manipulation, so we can make mutations in our gene, and we generally use E. coli for that. Um, so we got lots of E. 
people like growing in plates and in culture. Um, we also use E. coli as our system to actually purify the protein itself, so we can make pure starting six proteins used for lots of different studies. But um, if anyone has not seen the cool instrumentation that we have, we have a huge room of it that is really state of the art and pretty much what you would find anywhere that you would go and do this, like at a pharmaceutical company or other research institution. So we have we have the goods. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 super fun and. Uh, try to take students to conferences when I can. We went to um, ASBLB, which is the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. That national conference, it was back in March, and that was in Seattle. Dr. Higgins took some of her students as well. It was a super fun trip. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of <laughs> We do not at this time. Actually, um, much to the chagrin of my students, we may start with worms. <laughs> Um, because worms have an ortho orthologous, orthologous gene to start E6, so meaning that they have a gene that is supposed to have similar functions. Um, and it's really easy to actually genetically manipulate worms. <laughs> um, so you can do quite a bit with that. Um, so we'll see. But like I said, I, I, I'm really excited to get the human tissue samples because I think that that's going to give us a lot of valuable information that's just not there right now. And it's, I'm, I'm just, I don't know why. <laughs> It's really, really interesting to, um, so actually I think, I could be wrong, but I'm one of like three or four labs in the entire globe that's actually studying this protein. So there's, I'm the only one in the US, I think. There's one in Canada and two in Korea, I believe, but that's it. No, and they're all doing the genetic stuff, so I mean, there's nobody doing like the nitty gritty, like what does this protein actually do? And I think we need to know that before we can make this link because the link is cool but if you don't know what it's doing then it's kind of hard to figure that out. Wow. So, so that way students, that way students could be doing work that is only done here. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Are there any other questions for Dr. Powell? Well, I urge you to continue the conversation over snacks. Uh, and cake, that unmarked thing is queso, <laughs> so please dig in. Um, and um, I urge you to consider uh, also putting on your calendar our next faculty lecture, which is uh, Dr. Ilana Halingua, which is going to be uh, about mechanisms of mindfulness for psychological well-being, and it's on. Thursday, October 12th, right here uh, at from 4 to 5.30 p.m. So please continue the conversation, and um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.